You're listening to the preaching ministry of Redemption Bible Church in New Braunfels, Texas, where we are proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology. We pray that this message will be a blessing to you as you seek to worship Christ, walk with Christ, and work for Christ, all to the glory of God. For more information about our church, please visit redemption.bible. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you soon at one of our upcoming worship services. Once you have it, turn in your copy of God's Word to John 15, 18. We're picking up where we left off uh, last week in John's Gospel, uh, John 15, 18. And as you're uh, uh, turning there and finding that in, in your Bible, you remember when you came to Christ? And, and do you remember when that happened? Was everybody super excited about your newfound faith in the Lord? They, I mean, maybe some were, right? Maybe some were already following Jesus, some who, who, who loved the Lord. Maybe they were really excited, and maybe others were a little cool to the idea, and there was probably some that were not so uh, super excited as you began to experience the joy of following Jesus. Maybe there was even some unexpected blowback in your life. Or maybe it wasn't just uh, the moments when you first came to Christ, but now you've been walking with the Lord for, uh, for years, maybe even decades, and you can remember those moments along the way, or maybe you're even in one now where you've grown in some of your convictions about what it is to follow Jesus, and you realize there's some patterns in your life that have been hindering your fruitfulness. Things that uh, you, you've now had to make some changes as God uh, realized that, man, this is not necessarily a sinful thing, but it's become a consumptive thing, and now it is hindering your uh, growth in Christ and the fruits of the Spirit there. You know, for me, like, there's one of those moments was there's a point in my life where it's like really steeped in football, knowing all the stats and multiple fantasy leagues and thinking and reading about all things and watching games around the clock and apps going off and alerts about all the news and came to realize like this was squashing my joy and love and peace in the Lord and, and towards others and had to pull out from that, remove all the apps, remove all the things. And honestly, there were some people you know, like that weren't super excited about that decision. Yeah, not because I'm anything great, you know, in fantasy leagues or things like that. But following Jesus comes at a real cost. And so as we come to the upper room, now Jesus is preparing his disciples for what life and following him would look like. As we abide in him, as we abide in his love, uh, he is graciously preparing us to expect the blowback, or as we'll read in the text, the hatred from the world. And so hopefully you found the text in your Bible. Let me just read it for us. We're going to pick it up in 15, 18 and read actually through 16. Four. Listen here as I read. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when, they will, when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Now, this is God's word for God's people. How is this for like a super encouraging text this morning, right? But how is this for some preparation? 
as Jesus is about to leave and depart his, uh, from his disciples. And in this life, he is uh, wisely and graciously preparing uh, both his disciples and us for what is to come. Not everyone will be excited about your faith and about your growth in Jesus. You may have all kinds of untrue and unkind things said about you on behalf of Christ, and you may even be killed for it. And as he lays out that reality, there's a central expectation here about what following Jesus would, uh, looks like. It's here on the screen. Write it down in your notes. But you can expect to be hated by the world as you abide in Jesus and his love. At the center of this text, Jesus is teaching us that you can expect to be hated by the world as you abide in Jesus and his love. Now, as you write that down, track with the flow of what Jesus has been saying in the upper room. Back in chapter 13, he, you know, he, has, uh, uh, he has been teaching them how to serve. And this is a, uh, they, they, they're troubled about many things, about his announcement that he's leaving. They're troubled about uh, uh, Judas and his betrayal and Peter and his uh, denial. And to calm their fearful, anxious hearts, he tells them and invites them to abide in him to abide in his love. And he assures them then that the Holy Spirit will abide in in them and his word will abide in them as as well. And so he's inviting them into this abiding, this connection to him. That isn't like a a faith that's like a pull yourself up by your bootstraps, independent kind of abiding, but an invitation to come and experience his grace and his rest. For as the gardener, the gardener has grafted him into the vine, the master has made us his friend. Like, how incredible is that? Right? Like what Pastor Eric, as he opened up the previous text here, like the master, Jesus, in love, has said to us, the servants, we who were hated him, we who did not love him, he said, no, be my friend. That's the good news of Jesus. This is the gospel of grace. It's the joyful reality that is our salvation. And yet the sad reality in all this is not, uh, even as we get super excited about the Lord and our growing in our faith, not everybody else gets super excited about it all the time. Some may even become hostile. And thankfully in our text, Jesus in his wise and gracious preparation lays out these truths to anchor us when we are hated, when life is hard, and he gives us the help that we need for when we are hated. And that help comes with first understanding why. Why does this even exist? Well, why, why does the world hate us? Well, write this down. is because Jesus was hated first and foremost. Like that's, that's what he lays out in verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus hated first and foremost more than even us. He is hated. But why? Why does the world then hate Jesus? Maybe that's the question we need to ask. Why does the world hate us? Why, why, well, if Jesus is hated, well, why does it hate him? But even as we let that question hang for a moment, we should have a right understanding. Well, what is the world? Who is the world? Like, who is in view here? Well, it's, it's the Greek word cosmos, and it's, it, it, like, there's kind of multiple renderings of it, but it means like the order and arrangement. That it, it means the totality of all things. Okay? And so in John particularly, or you see this word in your New Testament world, it is referring to the, uh, the sinful uh, world systems. The, the sinful world systems, the totality of the order, the arrangement of all things, the broken, sin-corrupted world and its patterns or symptoms, those or systems, those things that we would say in our language, those things that are socially acceptable, politically correct or culturally trendy, the beliefs and practices that are widely held uh, amongst humanity. And these things are ever-evolving. Right? Over time, over eras, in, in different cultures, and amongst different people, they're always uh, changing in, in what those things actually are. But one thing is always true, no matter what time frame, and no matter what people uh, you find yourselves in, what is always true is that they're in opposition to Jesus and his way. They're always in opposition to Jesus and his, and, and, and his way. It, it was what is, whatever is the prevailing pattern of depravity, a professor at Moody back in the day, he's from Boston, a brilliant scholar, talking about uh, is one of my church history professors, and he would always encourage us, saints, don't be normal. 
be abnormal, for normality is only the prevailing pattern of depravity. Whatever is socially acceptable, whatever is culturally trendy here, and it is always in opposition to Jesus and his way. And so why? Why does the sinful world system hate Jesus? Well, the text reveals to us this, because Jesus has authority over the world. His authority over the world. And sin hates authority. Our independence hates in being told what to do or what to think or how to act. Jesus has authority over the world. He has the authority to take people out of the world. He has authority to set people on a different uh, trajectory. See, he, he starts to lay this out. He's like, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, right? If your life, if you were still in the world and your life matched the patterns of the world and your beliefs uh, matched all the, what is, uh, you know, the world would define as good and right and true and loving and all that, then it would love you. But Jesus has authority and has something very different to say. He is not of the world, then neither are we as his followers. He is over the world and he chose us out of the world as we have submitted to his authority. We've been saved, he says, we're chosen. I chose you out of the world and into his family. And thus, as believers, you've likely heard this uh, saying, you know, we are in the world, but not of the world. Until, you know, we go home, until we're in heaven, we're still here. And as we live differently in the world, this causes stumbling blocks. That's why verse 19, therefore the world hates you. As we have this faithful presence within the world, right? We're still here, so we can't just like totally withdraw. We can't isolate ourselves as uh, followers of Jesus. We, we, we don't do that, nor do we just let follow in the streams and whatever is trendy in our life is not just like in the world, nor do we withdraw, but we have a faithful presence presence following Jesus within the world, within, uh, amongst our family, amongst our friends, amongst our co-workers, in our classrooms there. We live here in the world, and as we do, what can we expect? Not everybody gets super excited. They may actually hate it. And so what are you saying? Like, I chose you before. If you're looking for signs that you're on the right road, Am I following Jesus? Am I doing this thing right? Am I faithfully following him? Well, you're, this, if you're in good company if you are experiencing the hatred and antagonism that comes from following Jesus. Not as a result of our sin, okay? Not, if you're getting blowback because you're living a sinful life, that's not what he's talking about. Nor is it just because if like, our life is hateful and antagonistic and offensive, no. But if we are faithfully following Jesus as we are abiding in him, as we are abiding in his love, not everybody is super excited about it because Jesus has authority over it. He's like, you're not, I experience this, Jesus is saying, and the servant is not greater than the master. He's already used this with him. He already told him this back in chapter 13. Remember, as he was setting the example, modeling what sacrificial service looks like. I'm washing feet. I am teaching you how to live a life. The servant is not greater than his master. And in the same way as Jesus teaches us how to serve one another, now he is also teaching us how to suffer when we are hated, right? And so people reject the authority of his word. They reject the disciples as well. But there's a second reason why the world hates Jesus. Not only is it because he has authority over it, but write this down, it's because Jesus exposes the world's sinful condition. His life, his works, his word, all throughout, as we've seen in the first 12 chapters, as Jesus moved throughout his life, ministering, teaching, uh, healing people, helping people, he experienced this all along the way. His light shone in the darkness. And so, it's why the world hates Jesus, why they hate us. It hates Jesus. Why does it hate Jesus? It's because Jesus shows sinfulness, and it still does then through us, through our lives, through his words. And so, you know, you get to this, this text here, and you're like, okay, well, they know, they, they do not know him. They, he exposes all of this. His life showed them that they are guilty of sin. You might be asking a question, you maybe have been reading Romans lately, and you're wondering, like, well, how does, like, verse 22, they're not guilty of sin. If he hadn't come, well, Romans 1 says, all men are not without excuse. How could somebody be not guilty of sin? The point that Jesus is trying to make here is that his, like, how much more evidence, how much brighter can the light show with Jesus right there in the flesh? 
he, his life, his coming actually exposed their evil. His shown, light shone so bright there was no hiding, not even in like the, 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 the false light of the pharisaical system. And so even as we too, as our light shines, as the light exposes others, and we get the blowback, the reviling for Jesus. And the, the sad reality is instead of hating sin as it gets exposed, the world hates Instead of sin, they hate Jesus. They hate the Father, and thus they also hate any who follow him. Maybe you've experienced, you know, as you say no to sin in your own life, as you say no to following cultural trends, as you say no to redefining uh, what God calls good uh, as evil and vice versa, as you, you know, make decisions, just simple things like, hey, I can't work on Sundays, as you make choices to guard your time so that you can prioritize the Lord and his people and serving uh, others, you know, others don't always understand. I think it's foolishness. Paul would write this, 1 Corinthians 1.18, that the gospel is foolishness or folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so as Christ comes, his uh, life, his words, expose the sinfulness, the sinful condition in us and in the world. But that isn't what oh, the only thing that Jesus came and showed as he came to live on this earth, is it? For what else did Jesus show? What else did his life demonstrate? What else was exposed as Jesus came? The love and grace and mercy and forgiveness of the Father. See, juxtaposed against the world's hatred in this passage is the Father's love in John 3, right? Like, you know this, what does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world. Like, turn over there, I want you to see this. See how, how incredible this is. Just go backwards a few, few pages. John 3, you know the, the passage, but even though we have it steeped in our memory, the familiarity of it may have lessened its impact. The world hates the Father because it shows sin. And yet, what does God show in return? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. See, this is the world that he sent into, a world that was already condemned for its hatred of Christ, for its hatred of God. And God, in great love, sent the Son who would be hated to save it. So in Christ and coming, he showed a way of following, a new way of of life, even as he exposed sin, he showed a way for forgiveness, a way to be freed from sin's penalty, a way to walk in the light, right? This is the judgment. Verse 19, keep reading. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. See, Christ came. He was hated, but he came in love. In all of this, Jesus has been teaching the disciples. It's not as he, though he gets to John 15, he's about to leave in a few hours, and he's like, oh yeah, by the way, life's going to get really hard when I go. Deuces. He's been teaching them all along the way, here to the disciples, here along, and the Old Testament also points to all of this. This isn't like new information. This is galvanizing information that Jesus is giving them as they are about to, uh, about to, to go. Verse, back in, in chapter 15, he's like, this is what they've done. They've hated me. They've hated my father, even though I sent him love. But he's, he, verse 25, he quotes then from the Psalms. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. We're back in John 15. Okay? What is he referring to? That's, that's actually repeated multiple times. John, or not John, Psalm 35, Psalm 69, Psalm 109, multiple places. David is writing these psalms and they hated him. 
a sinner saved by grace, that brought the hatred of others that was both irrational and unreasonable. Psalm 69, David's like, why do I have to repay bread that I didn't steal? And he's hated for it. And maybe you're saying, okay, well, you're, you're reading this, you're thinking like, how is this encouraging? Is this really what I signed up for when I started following Jesus? Or maybe you're on the fence even now. You're, you're, you're thinking to yourself like, man, I, uh, I'm, I'm considering all this thing, these things, the way of following Jesus, and I just want to know like, here, like, there's a great cost to following Jesus. Maybe nobody did tell you, here we are in the Word now, telling you right now that following Jesus will be hard. He warned of it. He told, he, he told, like, even back in the, you think of the Sermon on the Mount. Are you familiar with this? You all know the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you want them to what? do unto you. Well, right after that, I want you to see this. Go back to Matthew, okay? So you know that Jesus isn't just like hoodwinking us right before he's about to peace out. Matthew chapter 7, early on in his ministry, the Sermon on the Mount, he says the golden rule. This is verse 13, Matthew seven thirteen. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe it's a reminder. Maybe you need an emphasis this morning. What does he say? Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. 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 Underline that. Highlight it. Star it. Circle whatever you need to do so every time you turn to this page, your eyes are drawn immediately to that word. It's hard. That leads to what? Life. And those who find it are few. It's narrow. You only, you only, the way to life, the life that we all want, abundant life, eternal life in Jesus, it's narrow. You only get in through Christ. The path, there's one path. There's not many, it's not wide, and it is hard. How many times have we prayed and asked God, God, would you make my life more easy? It's a prayer he will not answer because it will lead to your destruction. But the way is hard. Hard, and I get it, life is hard. It's hard to love others. It's hard to love your enemies. It's hard to get up in the morning and abide in Christ, to abide in His love, to abide in His word. It's hard to forgive when you've been deeply wounded. It's hard to say no for the millionth time to that temptation. It's hard. It's hard hard to live at a grace-filled pace when the world is demanding a frenetic, destructive pace. Some days it's just hard to get up and wear matching clothes and remember to pack a lunch, isn't it? church thankfully we don't walk the road alone we don't walk the road what did what did we sung this morning what have we what are we seeing along the the gospels what is jesus offering you don't walk the way yes it's hard but you don't walk it alone you walk it yoked to christ you, you thankfully you don't walk the road in your own strength you don't have to just keep plodding along no you endure by his grace the spirit produces steadfastness in you not you so you walk through the difficulty you walk through the hardship you walk through the hatred yoked to jesus enduring by his spirit and so to answer the question then how is this encouraging Well, if you're experiencing the hatred of the world because you're abiding in him and abiding in his love, then you can be confident in this, that one, it happened to Jesus. You are in good company. You are on the right path when it is hard and when it is narrow. And you can also rejoice that everything is going according to plan. 
He told us that this would happen so that we would know. He, multi- he, 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 issued, he said it multiple times so that we would not miss it. Everything is going according to plan. The, uh, the disciples, all those that are sitting around the table in John 15 here, all of his disciples would experience it as, as they go. Just read the book of Acts. All that Jesus is saying in the upper room discourse, particularly the hatred of the world, getting kicked out of the synagogue, getting uh, uh, even those would be killed uh, for it. And yet, like Acts 5 says, they uh, rejoice because they were <laughs> to suffer the dishonor for the name of Jesus. Maybe they're remembering what Jesus is saying here, and so that's why they're rejoicing, because they're continuing to follow Christ, they're continuing to preach Christ, they're living this, and now, as they are being imprisoned and beaten and hated along the way, they are rejoicing in their suffering and dishonoring for the name, and they continue, then, to bear witness, along with the Holy Spirit. Read Acts 5, it's so incredible. They continue to tell others about Jesus at great risk, themselves, the Holy Spirit, bearing witness uh, uh, to the things of Jesus. And so what do we do? Okay, we understand. Like, all right, this happened. It's Jesus. I'm sharing in his suffering. This is to be expected in my life. And so what do we do? Well, the text tells us. And Acts 5 models it for us. But what should we do about it then? Write this down. We keep telling others about Jesus. We, we continue bearing witness uh, to these things that God has done in us. We continue bearing witness about Jesus, right? We, we continue to just in great love, with great grace, with great patience, talk about the Lord and to model even in the midst of hatred, even in the midst of hardship, the forgiveness and mercy of God towards us. Because what is our tendency in conflict? What is our tendency when things get hard? What is our tendency? It's usually one or the other, right? And they rhyme. What is, the, what is our tendency? We either fight or flight, right? We've heard that before. And, and, you know, sociologists, others, psychologists say like that. I mean, that's a very oversimplified uh, way of thinking it. But it is so true. You're likely familiar. In conflict, we either lash out, we put on our gloves and we want to punch back, or we just turn away and we run away from it. It's fight or it is flight and most conflict. And yet, this is not the way of Christ. This is not what we do. We don't just run away. We don't just withdraw. We don't just isolate. Nor do we just follow the worldly patterns. Nor do we don't, we don't just return evil for evil. But rather we have been called by God to bear witness to something greater. We've been called to respond uh, to something much better. Knowing what we know about the condition of the world and its depravity. That it is condemned already because it hates Jesus. And knowing what we know about Jesus and his great love and his great forgiveness. And how the gospel is the only hope for any sort of change in our life or across the world or across the nations. Knowing what we know, we are compelled to something greater. Greater compassion. Greater love, greater pity, greater compassion for their lostness in the same way that Jesus had compassion on us. Matthew records in Matthew 9, 38, that as Jesus looks out at the crowds, the masses of people gathered, as he looks on the crowds, he had compassion, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. As we look at the crowds as we face this hatred, as we see those dead in their sin, embattled from every side, harassed, world pressing in, sin mastering over them, and helpless, unable to do anything about it. That should evoke great pity, gratitude for the Lord for saving us, and pity or compassion for the person, for what else could they do? They are not our enemies. They are sinners, harassed and helpless to the patterns of this world. And unless Jesus comes in and makes the change, unless they come to know Christ, it won't make sense. They won't be super excited. And so what must we do? We must 
keep by God's grace, bearing witness to his grace of the saving forgiveness that Jesus offers in our words, in our actions, and pleading with God to open their eyes. To send other workers, other people, God, do what only you can do in their life. And so we keep bearing witness with the help of the Holy Spirit in us, not in our own strength. And at the same time, we keep pressing on in faith. See, the conversation really continues, it continues into chapter 13. I know we've got a chapter break here, but the flow of thought continues into these opening verses. And by God's grace, when we're hated, Jesus tells us to keep pressing on in faith. He's preparing them for it. I have said all these things to you. He's told them this before. He will keep them to the end. He said something uh, similar to this back in chapter 14, verse 29. He's like, I'm telling you this beforehand, before it takes place, so that you will believe me. So that when it happens, you know that I told you that I've prepared you for it. And not many hours from now, things are going to get really hard for the disciples. They're going to be hated for following Jesus. You know, this is the, the, the Jesus last night. He's going to go and pray uh, he, uh, and uh, the garden, and then Judas will bring the cohort of soldiers. He will be betrayed with a kiss. Matthew tells us, Matthew 26, 56, that the disciples left him and fled. How's that for friendship? How's the... Yeah, the Jesus just said in the, in the passage before this, I've made you friends. I've called you friends. And if there are any moments in Jesus' humanity where he needed the proximity of his friends, he needed the fellowship of the brothers around him, while he's praying in Gethsemane, agonizing, and his brothers are falling asleep, and then when he's being betrayed and he needs their, their proximity, he needs their encouragement, he needs their strength, and deuces. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story for the disciples, though, is it, church? They would be kept in faith. They would follow Jesus to the very end, most of them to the death, John, who writes this, into exile. And so Jesus tells them, I'm writing this, I'm telling you this now, so that it will keep you, to keep you from falling away. If he didn't graciously save them, if he hadn't graciously called them, they, of course, they, they would not persevere to the end. If what Jesus said in John 10, that no one will snatch you out of, out of my hand. Of course, they would fall away. The parable of the soils, things get hard. Trials and temptations come. What happens? The sun gets hot and the flower withers away. Apart from the gracious, persevering grace of our God. He said this to them. Even when the unthinkable happens, which is really what verse uh, 2 is. Like to the Jewish person in that day being kicked out of the synagogue, which would happen as you read through the book of Acts. It was like the worst possible punishment. It's like a cutoff from all things in life. It wasn't like just, hey, you'll be asked to leave the service for being unruly. But you'd be cut off from family, cut off from friends, cut off from support, cut off from business contacts. And the, the same is true. Following Jesus comes at a cost. Even as you uh, are, uh, walk through this life, there is a cost uh, to following him. And it may cost some friendships. It may cost family relationships. It may cost business contacts. And even as others do it, they may think like the Pharisees thought in that day that they were offering service or worship to God. Jesus would be put to death by the Jews thinking they were serving God because he was a blasphemer. Stephen would be stoned in Acts 7. James would be killed in Acts 12. Paul would be imprisoned in the last chapters of Acts. And all this pleased the Jews. Prophets beforehand, as you read your Old Testament, were killed because they didn't like the message. And church history tells us that all the men around that table in our passage today would either be killed or exiled for following Jesus. And why? Why? Why are they hating in this way? Because they do not know God. They have not known the Father, nor me, nor Jesus. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. 
So what is Jesus saying? He's saying all this to keep us abiding close. When you are hated, when life is hard, abide even tighter. Do not fall away when life gets hard. See, apart from Jesus, the hardships of life would sink us. We would abandon all faith and all hope but God. See, hard times don't mean end times. Hard times don't mean end times. Hard times means grace times. Hard times means steadfast times. Hard times means persevering grace times. He will keep us to the end. He will not lose you. He will not fail you. Christ is all that we have. Redemption. And nothing reveals that more explicitly than in moments of persecution. When we are being unjustly accused or whatever may be happening. For it is in those moments when we turn and look to Christ who stares back at us with knowing eyes says, I know. I experienced it too. On my way to the cross for you. They hated me too. I told you that it would be so. So hold my hand and let's press on together. That's the invitation. That's the grace and mercy of Jesus when we're hated. Let's pray and ask him for help in that, shall we? God in heaven, here we are. Thankful for passages like this. that give us a right perspective, right expectation of how we should live our life. And so while it's not easy, Lord, while we maybe are wrestling through some of these things, we do just tell you thank you. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for telling us. Thank you for helping us. And yet, uh, we want to just pray, God, for those uh, in, in this room right now who maybe are in this moment, who today are experiencing hatred, hatred in at their workplace, hatred in the classroom, hatred from a family member, maybe hatred in their own marriage. Give them the grace, give them the help, steadfastness they need to abide in you, God. Lord, if there are any in this room, even now, who are wrestling with following you, who are counting the cost who are wondering, is this even worth it? Lord, would you both convict and convince that yes, any hatred, anything that may come, anything that we must say no to is infinitely greater than what the world offers. That following you is always worth it, both now and forever. And so do your saving, convincing, regenerative work even now in their heart. May all of us, God, turn from our sin and turn towards you in humility, God. May we all uh, seek to abide in you. Give us the help that we need, God, by your spirit for the moments. Lord, the moments when our natural tendencies take us far from you. But thank you that you've given your help, God. We worship you because we hail you as our king, as our rescuer, as our savior. We worship you for your goodness. We pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen.